welcome you to an informative and an engaging session. First of all, my name is Judy Fairholm, and I have the privilege of working with Laura Lee as co-lead on COVID-19 and child protection with the Alliance. Today, we are going to unpack Technical Note 2, the protection of children dur during the coronavirus. And I hope that this will be a very engaging situation. And we are going to do this through three learning opportunities. The first one will be a short webinar by Hani Manasurian, who is one of the coordinators at the Alliance Secretariat. After that, we will go into an interview format with Hani and Audrey Boilier, who is the other Secretariat Coordinator at the Alliance, plus Zeynep Sanduvik from Turkey and Riyadh Alenjem from Syria and now in Sweden, and Sarah Lim, who oversees the knowledge management for the Alliance. So welcome to all of you. Welcome to the panel. Welcome to those behind the scene who are making this happen. And I'm going to turn it over to Hani, who is first of all going to do the presentation on Technical Note version two. As many of you know, there was a version one of the Technical Note that was released uh, in March. Recently, we, with collaboration with actually several of you who, who are on the call, we revised uh, version one and created the version two that was released in May that reflects some of the latest evidence on how children are being impacted by COVID-19 and also reflect some of the feedback that we received from some of you who have been working for, uh, with version one of the technical notes. The technical note version one had a huge success. It was picked up uh, very widely by child protection actors, donors, policymakers. Our website shows that it has been downloaded 55,000 times, uh, which is a very large number for the type of product that this is. The aim of the brief is to support child protection practitioners and policymakers in putting the child's safety and well being at the center of their COVID 19 response pandemic. I want to emphasize on the, on the aspect of well being, because safety sometimes gets understood purely as the health aspect of, of safety. But from our perspective, we want to make sure that the other elements of, of safety and well-being, uh, a lot of which relate to the work of child protection, uh, also get um, put at the center of the response plans. Uh, we want practitioners to be able to apply this directly to their work in their own context. As you might have seen, the, the technical note is, is almost a centerpiece um, to a range of more thematically focused technical notes that are considered annexes to the, to the main technical note. If you go to our website, as where the address is, is posted, so if you go to our website, you will see that version two is there, but then there's nine different annexes that have been produced to reflect the different areas, thematic areas within child protection. So just to highlight, one of the changes that has come in version two as compared to version one is the emphasis on the importance of context. When we developed version one, it was not yet as clear or clear cut in the sense of how different contexts are going through different periods or episodes of the pandemic itself or the, or the epidemic in each context. So we, we wanted in this, in this particular version to put extra emphasis on uh, the three broad, of course, there are multiple subcategories within each of these stages, but we wanted to make sure that we, we draw attention on the importance of paying attention of whether we are in the preparedness mode, in the response mode, or in transition or on recovery. Of course, noting that the situation is very fluid. I mean, we see just the past couple of days, we have been hearing reports from China that had quote unquote controlled the epidemic in their in their country. Now Beijing is seeing uh, a resurgence, so they will go into into more response mode. Many countries have experienced this in the in the past couple of months. So we wanted to make sure that while we we draw attention to this, we also don't create the image that once you're in response, then you're in response. It's not 
it's not as uh, as black and white as that so we want we also wanted to highlight and we draw draw attention to the fact that there are three key ways that children are are impacted by this pandemic one is through the infection of the virus itself which while the evidence is is limited it seems that as compared to some other um, epidemics and pandemics, such as, for example, Ebola, the scale of, uh, of the impact on children is smaller, both in terms of the number of children that are shown symptoms, but also the gravity of the symptoms itself. Again, there are cases that uh, seem to contradict this, but overall, it seems that so far that that's the, the consensus. Um, the second way that children are impacted uh, is through social and economic impact of the response and recovery. And as we have seen, this has been uh, a large part of what child protection actors focus on um, because it seems that the, the very extreme nature of some of the lockdowns and, and quarantine measures that have been put in place um, are having a significant impact on, on the well being of, of children. And the last way um, children are impacted is through longer term effect, including economic downturn and delay in achievement of, uh, of development goals. Um, so in, in the case of child protection, as, as we all know, uh, there's, there are several SDGs that relate to child protection, but two prominent ones, 8.7 that, that deals with child labor and 16.2 uh, that deals with violence against children. Projections are such that the, the impact of the pandemic itself and the long run uh, economic uh, issues that will ensue will potentially put the achievement of those uh, sustainable development goal, goals um, pretty out of, out of reach, unfortunately. We have, again, this is one of those elements that we wanted to, to bring out a bit more in this version, and that's the, the issue of the guiding principles. The guiding principles outlined here, I'm not gonna go through them because you can see them on the slide and in the, in the notes. They're partly borrowed from the minimum standards for child protection and humanitarian action, and partly very specific to this technical note and the context of COVID-19. And this note apply, applies specifically the issue of inclusion. It advocates for full government and community engagements and while addressing risk factors, and it emphasizes some of the protective factors that um, the version one didn't necessarily highlight as, as much. And similar to version one, the socio-ecological model is at the center of, of, the version, as the, uh, of this version of the technical note. It is in line with the CPMS and how it, how it frames the strategies of, for child protection interventions. As you, you probably have seen in the, in the technical note itself, um, we have added not only risk factors, kind of across the different layers of the socio-ecological model, but also protective factors. And this is one of the additions to, the, to version two. Um, and the idea is to help reinforce the idea that protective factors are uh, one of the elements that we need to pay attention to and, um, and strengthen if we are to, to protect children in a situation like this. We can't only focus on risk factors. So just to give you an example, at the family level, for example, we, we talk about family separation, reduced access to social support, caregiver distress, heightened risk of violence, disruption of livelihood and poverty as, as some of the risk factors that exist at the family level that directly affect a child. Now, we also talk about family time and activities, families having opportunities to be together more than before. Um, so children being with parents, uh, more often, sometimes fathers being more at home and potentially having or being forced to have a bit more time with their children, um, social support through um, inform information technology uh, and some of the informal um, support systems that the, the remote access might provide. These are some protective factors that, that may exist that we need to reinforce and strengthen. Section two goes into some of this child child protection specific responses and I'm going to um, hand over to Audrey to walk us through section two. Thank you very much honey and I'm very pleased to be here today and to guide you through uh, section two from the technical note. Um, so section two we look at uh, two 
category under child protection response during and beyond the pandemic. The first one, it will look at toward a multi-sectoral response, working with communities, including children, family, government, and other sectors. Uh, for the ones who are familiar with the CPMS, you will see as well that we have uh, referred to the CPMS and uh, using the same icons, so it's easier for you to have as well some kind of connection. So this section particularly encourages a multi-sectoral response that looks at children's caregivers and community needs. The guidance is given for education, wash, nutrition, health, shelter, livelihood, food security, camp management, and you will find as well at the beginning a generic guidance for all. For each of these icons, there are priority action that we can take. For example, psychosocial support can be found under health and suggest training, adaptation of service provision, building on children resiliency and coping strategies and collaboration with other sectors. So the second section under part two is really uh, child protection specific programs and the actions are the, for the frontline workers. And as Hani mentioned at the beginning, we have looked as well at the different stages of uh, the pandemic and, and the situation for countries. So you will see that the examples are divided whether we are in preparedness actions, response actions, or transition and recovery action. Again, it, it is very much built on the CPMS and it is contextualized uh, through questions to think about. And the use of the, of the question is the difference that compared to the previous version, because in version one, we had statements. You will see with that diagram, uh, hopefully we are hoping that this diagram leads you to the question to consider for the stage of the pandemic you are presently experiencing. And as Annie mentioned, there are some possible back and forth between the different stages. And I, as you know, each context could easily go back to a previous stage. So all the questions remain relevant. The purpose of them are to help contextualize your decisions and action. The questions are built around the CPMS for well-being, strengthening environments, community approaches, case management, alternative care, and justice for children. You may think of many more questions, but these are the guiding ones to inspire your curiosity and understanding as you apply the CPMS. And then you will see that there are four final questions to think about. What has been learned? Have we listened to children? How do we identify good promises practices? And finally, how will lesson learned be applied to future infectious disease outbreak? Then you will see under the technical uh, node version two that you have a part three and Hani mentioning at the beginning where we have uh, put references to all the annexes that have been developed uh, following the technical node uh, one. And uh, you can have access to them and we have currently if I'm not mistaken, it's nine uh, annexes that are there to support you on specific child protection uh, topic. Uh, the final section of the technical note, you will see part four are some resources around COVID-19 and child protection. And part five, you will find a feedback form and a case study form, and we will very much encourage you to uh, send your feedback on the technical note and the annexes. Um, as well as to send us some case studies, because we have as well noticed that case studies bring life to these documents. And we want to know what is working and what is challenging. So your input is very important. And now, just for you to be aware, um, we are going through another process of translation. So we currently have the technical note two translated into Arabic, French, Spanish, and Farsi, and we are hoping for more to come. Thank you very much. A big thank you to Hani and to Audrey for walking us through that. As you can see, that Technical Note 2 has been built on Technical Note 1, but there are many new areas for us to consider and also ways of us to consider it. So there's lots of questions. 
So now we're going to go into a round table and have a discussion with these people and see if we can dig down a bit closer. So the round tables with Hani, Audrey, Sanap, and Riyadh, and I want to welcome you all to the round table. So Audrey, let's start with you. Thank you, Judy. Um, so I'm Audrey Bollier. I am uh, one of the two coordinators of the Alliance, seconded by Plan International. I'm a psychologist by background, and I've been working with children since I am 18 years old, mm -hmm. um, starting with a uh, youth club and summer camps in my own community. I was doing this job in parallel to my uh, studies. And then I started my humanitarian work and my steps took me uh, toward child protection quite naturally. And I've been doing that work for many years now. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for um, this opportunity. And I am really pleased to be here uh, with all of you. Thank you for joining us. Um, actually, I am a social worker. So especially learning and sharing is my passion. So I am so happy for learning others and for sharing my experiences and knowledge with others too. I think this is my motivated uh, part uh, for being in this sector. So uh, this is Riyad Al Najm. I'm uh, I work for Haras Network a uh, Syrian NGO that is dedicated for child protection. Um, I've studied business administration as a profession, but um, I try to be specialized more in uh, managing humanitarian work and uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, I started working with children like um, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, I was a volunteer with the Syrian Red Crescent. Um, and then uh, from there, with the start of uh, uh, with, uh, 2011, I started working with the uh, most vulnerable children in the community. And then it led me uh, back to the humanitarian work. Um, uh, and then, yeah, uh, I'm stuck there. I think everyone who um, gets into humanitarian work will not uh, never ever uh, get out of it. Thank you very much. Hani, can you now give us a quick overview of who you are. Sure, Hani Mansurian, as I mentioned before, co-coordinating the alliance with Aji. So I began, I actually studied engineering um, and then later on uh, for my doctoral studies, I studied public health, um, focusing on uh, separation of children um, and how to measure it. Um, but I started working uh, in the field of child protection, uh, primarily dealing with children that are, um, that are living and working on the streets um, in Tehran, which is my hometown. And, um, and then uh, when an earthquake happened in, in, a, in a city called Bam in 2003, I, I moved there where Audrey also worked, but we didn't actually meet there. So we didn't know each <laughs> other when we started working together. Um, and since 2003, I have always worked in, in humanitarian settings, so in conflict and uh, places affected by conflict, by natural disasters um, and, and epidemics and infectious disease outbreaks. I, the reason I, I feel like I, I remain and I remain passionate about child protection is, is almost the, the ideal future that I, that I envision for, for the world, for a world where um, peace is, is much more interaction than, than war and conflict. And I think children are key to that. And if we can, if we can find a way to, um, to provide an environment for our children to, to develop and uh, grow up um, well, um, then we will achieve that that ideal world. But if you don't, then we'll continue in this in this cycle of, of violence and, and perpetuating um, violence. So that's my motivation staying in, in the field. That's great. Thank you. So you can see we have a very diverse group from social work to psychology to engineering to business and yet people all sharing this passion. So let's delve a little bit deeper into technical note two and what that means on the ground. 
but let's first understand the Alliance. So Audrey, can you tell us how the Alliance has been positioned to prevent and respond to child protection? I think the Alliance um, has been position or is positioned to prevent and respond to a child protection issue, first of all, because of its um, global network nature. Um, we have over 100 members and over 55% of them are national organizations. So we are benefiting from uh, lots of expertise from a diverse group of practitioners who are very engaged and committed into the work of the Alliance, uh, bringing up as well um, issues that they are encountering at the field level. Um, so it allows us to be really um, connected uh, with, what, with that, what is happening when we are um, developing global resources and we try as best as we can to really get inputs from uh, from those colleagues working on the field and the second thing is that I think the Alliance has as well an a, a drive structure that allow us to um, to have a certain flexibility and to be able to respond when the crisis hit. And we have, as I said, a lot of people with experience that are able to, uh, you know, connect the dot, relay from their previous experience, and help us to really um, think forward uh, and and yeah, and develop. Uh, resources that are still very much needed and relevant for the field. So honey, when we look back, when we look back or we look in at COVID-19, when did you actually realize that it was going to put children at risk and what that risk would look like? It was actually very early on and it was primarily based on, um, and again, I'm, I'm not alone. I was one of the many that, that raised the flags, but for me, it was based on the experience I had responding to the Ebola um, epidemic in, in West Africa. I was stationed in, uh, in Sierra Leone um, for part of the, the over one year um, crisis that, that they had uh, with Ebola in Sierra Leone. And well, having seen how protection of children was, was jeopardized by the pandemic and by the measures that were put in place, including school closures, um, really kind of the moment I saw COVID-19 in, in China and then it started um, spreading to other countries, I it just, my antennas went up and I was, I was ready to, uh, to roll up the sleeves and, and get to work. Um, but I was also scarred by, by how difficult it was in that particular crisis in, in during the Ebola crisis to get child protection to be recognized as as one of the um, one of the sectors that needs to be part of the part of the response um, at the time within the what they call the command centers in in Sierra Leone um, they were talking about the pillars and and child protection and psychosocial support was not one of the was not mm -hmm. one of the pillars for several months into the response um, and it was through the advocacy of a lot of colleagues um, for us. To, to finally manage to put a, a pillar in the uh, command center uh, that would support children um, and provide psychosocial support specifically when um, individuals were being taken away, when quarantines were being put in place, um, because we unfortunately had, through, had to learn through the, the hard way in, in witnessing a lot of children being separated, witnessing a lot of children dealing with, with uh, trauma, um, and and everyone everyone was almost um, convinced because the, the evidence was overwhelming. Um, so in this in this crisis, I would say probably in February was when when I started getting a sense that this is going to be um, a bit a bit larger than what um, what we all hope it would be, um, and felt like we need to uh, we need to act, and we were. As Audrey said, because of the agile structure of the Alliance, we managed to pull together an interagency group. Um, and by early March, um, we had the group together and we started working um, very, very quickly and, and swiftly towards, towards production of the technical note. 
Yeah, and then you produce technical note one. And if you look at that, and we know that this is just an evolving situation, what is the landscape? What changes have you seen in the landscape that are happening now that have moved from technical one and now into what we're facing with technical note two? How's that landscape changed? Yeah, I mean, technical note one um, almost hit a note because because I think because we had we had been prepared and by the time it was, I, I remember very distinctly when we were developing technical note one, we were debating whether we call it a pandemic or epidemic because it was yet not even declared a pandemic by WHO. Mm -hmm. uh, so because we were a bit slightly ahead of the game and that's, I think most of you who have been working in child protection for many years know that unfortunately child protection, a lot of the time is always playing catch up because we are we're not necessarily always considered a key sector in, in some of the humanitarian response. So we always have to kind of try to catch up. But in this case, uh, I think we managed to uh, circumvent at least some of that and not have to constantly play catch up. So, and that's part, part of what, what I, why I think version one was such a success is that we had it ready by the time a lot of the organizations kicked into gear to, to actively respond to, uh, to the pandemic. Um, in terms of your, your question about the, the global landscape and how it has changed, of course, it was not nearly as big when we started. Um, we had not learned all of, the, all of the details and a lot of the lessons that we, we now know about, about the virus and how it spreads. All of the phases were not as clear at the time to us. Um, it, it, they weren't as established as they are now. Now, as you know, over 188 countries have been have been affected. Uh, over 90% of children uh, around the world have been affected by school closures. Um, and another element that I think, in terms of the the landscape, the change in the landscape, is that we we didn't because we didn't know the scale of this. We weren't sure of what kind of longer term um, impact we are looking at. Now we know with the projections in terms of the, the economic impact of, of this in the long run and the number of, number of people and children that are projected to go into poverty that is projected, um, I, last I saw was 44 to 66 million children might go into, might fall into poverty um, it's the first time in, in a couple of decades that the world is seeing an increase in, in the number of people in poverty. Now, because we know this, we know that this is going to be a much larger issue than the, than the epidemic or the pandemic itself. That we are going to be dealing with the consequences of this in the long run. And I think that's one of the major differences between what, what was there at the time of version one and when, when, where we are today. Uh, when we have the version two. Yeah, thanks, honey. That's very sobering thought of where we're going. So one of the things that have been done within uh, the versions, there's also been annexes. So the, we have nine annexes, which go in deeper into different <laughs> areas. So Zanep, I would like to ask you, um, how have you used the technical notes and the annexes? How have they felt? What have you done with them on the field? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we are based in Istanbul, uh, in Turkey. Uh, we are calling Nirengi Association. We are working on child protection and MHPSS, basically. So the technical note... Um, has been translated in Turkish too. Also, we provided the editing process and then we are just joining the process with pleasure. Uh, we are using the technical note and the annexes as a, uh, a part of awareness raising and knowledge sharing. For instance, as Nurengi Association, we are member of the Child Protection Working Group in Turkey and UNHCR Turkey is leading this group. We conducted uh, a few serial uh, webinars for introducing the technical note, technical note one. 
For instance, we just uh, immediately set up these webinars for sharing with different uh, stakeholders. Around four webinars back to back we conducted. The reflections from the uh, participants was the technical note good, useful, and gives a holistic approach for delivering the child protection in COVID-19 days. So it was really functional for sharing others and creating common understanding about the child protection perspective from the global to the national level. Additionally, we translate the technical note COVID-19 for protecting children from violence in the home in Turkish. We have already planned to disseminate it through the and we meeting with cooperation of UNHCR Turkey the next week also. I think that's enough. I have Excellent. So there are webinars happening in Turkish. That's great. Riyadh, how are, what's happened in Syria? with the technical notes and the annexes. Yeah, thank you so much. So first of all, we've like used the technical note to, uh, uh, to build our response and contingency plans for uh, protecting children uh, in this emergency. Um, um, it also helped us to achieve a better quality when it comes to uh, mainstreaming of child protection uh, into other uh, sectors, especially uh, uh, health and education. Um, uh, also, when it comes to annexes, uh, working with uh, uh, working with children, uh, the alternative care for children also was one of our core uh, um, documents to build our response. Also, working with communities to keep children safe was very valuable as we work with uh, um, child protection committees. So we train them on um, on, on the uh, proper response for COVID-19. We also support them with uh, uh, and the volunteers in the community to um, support uh, the initiatives, local initiatives when it comes to like uh, remote education and other child protection related services. Um, another annex is uh, protecting, protecting children uh, from violence, abuse and, and neglect in home. Um, this was very useful. We've used it to design a special tool, um, a, an assessment tool to help us absorb um, the trends of violence that would emerge uh, um, in the community uh, and the purpose of that so we can uh, take those concerns and uh, just mainstream them into our uh, activities like uh, case management, PSS, uh, education, awareness raising and, and helplines. And uh, the last annex was the uh, social service work, uh, social, social services um, workforce safety and uh, wellness during COVID-19. This was like uh, the cherry on the top. Uh, <laughs> we've used it to, uh, um, it allowed us to, to complement the response um, in caring to our staff members and it helped us helped us to uh, consider like new aspects uh, when it comes to our duty of cares. That's fabulous. Thank you. It's, it's great to know that they are being applied so uh, clearly right to the ground level. So Audrey, uh, in the technical note there are talks about many risks and sometimes one can become overwhelmed because there's so many risks. If you had to identify the three top risks to consider, what, what would those be? The first one is psychosocial distress, and I think it's an important one. The, the children have been through a massive disruption in their lives. Uh, no more schools, no more uh, extra scholar activities, uh, being away from their family members, extended family members. But uh, I mean, I think everyone have heard story about children not necessarily understanding why they couldn't go and see their uncles, auntie, grandparents, etc. And and sometimes our own difficulty to be able to explain to them that. So yeah, psychosocial distress. I think it's it's 
one of the top. The violence at home, and uh, going back to what Riyadh was saying, um, because as well, and it has been said many times, but uh, identification and reporting uh, have decreased, uh, mainly due to some um, health measures such as lockdown and, and confinement, and, and as well because cl schools were closed, uh, youth club, children clubs, all those type of places where we usually, um, where we were able to identify those children, they were closed. So we, we know in one sense that uh, there, there is violence and there is an increase of violence and we have seen evidence coming up, but we don't know yet to which extent uh, children have been exposed to violence. And the last one, and I'm going back to what Honey was saying a little bit earlier about the eco economical uh, stretch and mm -hmm. consequences of COVID-19. And a uh, few colleagues last week over the uh, webinar on child labor were already mentioning that despite the health measures and restrictions in place, et cetera, in some contexts they have seen uh, children going back to work. And I think we are just at the beginning of the issue as well when it comes to child labor. Yeah. So Audrey, thank you so much for that overall sort of global look at what you see. And when you listen to that, Riyadh, and hear what Audrey has said, and then you go into Syria, would you say that those three risks are the same, or would you identify three different risks for Syria? So, so yes, I would agree. But um, uh, until now, like uh, when, where we operate in Syria, in, in northern Syria in particular, we don't have any confirmed cases yet. So it's a bit difficult to say what kind of uh, um, like like uh, the uh, the risks that are associated to COVID-19 in particular. But if we look now at the social distancing uh, mm -hmm. that we're taking as as a measure for for uh, like um, as a response for the pandemic, we can see the um, the access uh, to education is one of the main concerns at the moment. Um, children have like already lost an academic year, especially that also they have uh, suffered a, um, a forced displacement wave recently before the pandemic. So, so a whole year academic year is, is gone now. Um, also like physical and emotional uh, uh, distress and abuse also is, is one of the main concerns. Um, in case of, of the pandemic, if it breaks in, in uh, northern Syria, uh, then we're looking at, uh, I think the, the most like uh, concern that we'll be looking at is unaccompanied and uh, separated children. Hmm. As um, uh, we will be looking at, in my opinion, a high rate of, of uh, death and uh, um, because like in, in Syria now, it's the perfect environment for the uh, uh, virus to spread. People are uh, in camps, uh, over uh, 4 million people in a very small uh, um, geographic area. Uh, when we ask them to keep uh, like uh, social distancing they, uh, or stay at home, they say, which home? We don't have home to stay at. So, um, yeah, unaccompanied and separated children would be like the major risk if uh, the, the pandemic um, breaks in Syria. Okay, and Zeynep, when you listen to those risks in Syria, are there similar ones happening in Turkey or do you have some unique ones? Top three risks, right? We applied an online follow-up survey uh, to receive the reflections of child protection working group members during the introductory webinars about the risk prioritization. So we asked them basically, how would you rank the child protection risks in Turkey between one and six, I mean. So top three were prioritized respectively if I can say, one of them is, first one is physical em and emotional abuse. And second one is gender-based violence. And third one 
both child labor and mental health and psychosocial problems. I think there are some overlap with the global perspective and context-based also reflections are confirming in Turkey reality. Also the answers are representing both host community and Syrian community, uh, Syrian refugees uh, or, or, or other refugees also, because the working group members are mainly working with the refugee population, but also they are so uh, sensitive mm. and they are alert for getting reflections from the host community. So the working group members' reflections are representing for, I mean, for Turkey, top three, you know physical and emotional abuse, gender-based violence, both mental health and, uh, and child labor. Well, that starts giving you a map of where you need to work and, exactly. and what needs to be done. So when you look at protective factors, Zineb, so we are looking clearly at protective factors because we need to understand them to also help us map what we need to do. Uh, what protective factors do you think are really critical for children to be safe from violence? Uh, looking at the full part of the glass is always important. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. This is this is our this is our motivated uh, motivation um, part. I think it is really important. Personally, and uh, I mean, uh, I am sure the other colleagues also. We all believe to the protective factors may lessen the likelihood of children being abused or neglect or protect from all types of violence, right? Identifying and understanding protective factors are equally as important as researching risk factors. Mm -hmm. From Turkey side, I may say I may say both family-based protective factors and community-based protective factors are critical for children to be safe from the violence. Regarding the family-based protective factors, I specifically believe some of them are really, really important, especially supportive family environment and, if possible, uh, social network, you know. Mm -hmm. We should mm -hmm. push this social network part in, in this type of, you know, epidemics or COVID-19. So the other one is concrete support for basic needs. Yeah, this is, this is very, very, uh, very obvious. Yes. And the other one that I can say, access to healthcare and social services. These are family-based uh, factors, I can say. As to the community pr protective uh, factors, actually, uh, it is fact that the existence of local NGOs on the scene, one of the critical uh, factors for children to be safe from the violence, is really local NGOs importance of local NGOs are so critical. Even during COVID-19 days in Turkey, and I, I am communicating with other colleagues all over the world, you know, uh, they, are, uh, they are experiencing the refugee issue and poor community uh, dynamics and so on. Actually, the local NGOs, I mean, in Turkey, Syrian local NGOs, have strong communications, have strong connection with households, with, with different reasons, from the providing of basic needs to support the family environment and so on. But again, we experience that when the COVID cases uh, increased dramatically at the top and peak level, still they were visiting families. Mm -hmm. You know, helplines are really important. I think this is another important point, but 
you know, accessing them, giving support to them face to face or just knock the door, get back, you know, two meters away and try to speak with the, um, with the um, household uh, people. These are really important, I can say. Yeah, so you've really highlighted the local NGO, of course, who knows the culture, knows the community, and that human support is critical. Yes. Riyad, what have you found in, in Syria as far as those protective factors? So I would um, agree with Zainab, and I will try not to repeat uh, what she has already said, as um, lots of what she mentioned uh, applies to us. Um, but maybe I would I will try to share some like uh, things that we've done to to protect children. Um, so first of all, uh, like as CP uh, actors, try to build routines for children um, that make them like calmer during the day and on the younger level like more resilient. Um, uh, through our response, we, we've provided uh, education and uh, BSS online now. Um, and there's a question uh, in the chat about that. Maybe I'll answer it now. We've designed uh, kits uh, for, for children with uh, like different activities, with the material, and we've distributed them uh, to, to their homes. And we follow up with them uh, online. Like today, we're going to do this and this. Uh, um, and we do it through routine. For example, we share with them like uh, 8 a.m. in the morning, uh, the math uh, uh, exercises. Uh, and then like uh, 4 p.m. we share like uh, the PSS activity that sh they should do now. And we refer to, to what material they have in the box that they should use. And for example, 7 uh, p.m. we share like physical exercises. Um, uh, the material that we, sh we use should be always uh, uh, easy, fun, and uh, with uh, like uh, minimal like homework for uh, uh, parents not to stress a lot. Uh, mentioning parents also, parenting, the parenting skills are very important, especially during this time. Now parents have to work, uh, work around the home, and also take care of children, education, and activities. So. You can imagine, uh, as parent, uh, um, all the uh, psychological stress that you are under. So parenting skills is really important. Um, also, school teachers and uh, social workers kept in contact with children uh, on the phone as much as possible. Uh, BSS facilitators are uh, having like weekly calls with uh, in, in a group set with with children so they can identify uh, trends that require like uh, special attention also uh, case management uh, um, workers have like um, intensified uh, follow-up and visits uh, for the most vulnerable children as they are like, uh, they, they require special attention uh, uh, in emergencies. Um, also like uh, you can deliver uh, your messages uh, and uh, recommendation in, in a very good like and, and fun way. I don't know if I can share my screen. I, okay, maybe I can't, I will share it later. It's a board game that we've designed, for example. Oh, good, for fun. Yeah, so it's fun and it delivers uh, um, like lots of uh, recommendations and it keeps them occupied through, uh, through the day. So try to find like uh, very easy uh, and fun like activities for children. That's great. That's really great. So honey, as you listen to this and as you have the vision to look down the road, what do you see are the emerging trends? that we need to be aware of? You've mentioned a couple, but what what ones do you Yeah, think? I mean, of course, there, there are all the ones that um, colleagues mentioned. Uh, so we definitely see spikes in, in uh, cases of violence and abuse in, in, in the home, mostly. Uh, issues of sexual violence and gender rights violence are, are increasing. Um, now we are kind of looking, looking to the future. Um, and looking at some of the risk factors, uh, we talked about some of the risk factors, we've talked about some of the protective factors. 
um, what they what they help us when you look at kind of exacerbating risk factors and weakening protective factors, it kind of points points to what you should expect in the future, right? So the fear that we have is that things like child labor, forced marriage, uh, teenage pregnancy, um, and in, for example, areas of conflict, recruitment of children into armed forces and groups. Um, these are issues that, that we probably, if you're not taking a preventative approach and trying to address these risk factors and, and improve and strengthen protective factors, it's very likely that we are going to see these things, just we have seen in the past, um, in, in the past emergencies and also infectious disease outbreaks such as, such as Ebola. And now because this one, as we discussed, um, is projected to have a much larger economic impact um, and pushing more people into poverty as compared to almost any, um, any emergency that we have seen in the, in the recent past. Um, I feel like these issues um, that we, we kind of can see in the coming in the future are even more uh, of a concern than, than if it was something that was affecting five countries, right? Um, so I think that kind of points to that to the fact that prevention is it has to be a huge part of this. And I always um, talk about the child protection crisis that we have ahead of us being a, being an iceberg. We only see the tip of it, which are the reports that we get about violence and abuse. And the rest of the iceberg is under the water, and and we won't see it um, until until we really dig. But we have the opportunity to potentially uh, address it sooner rather than waiting for it. So in addressing that and looking at it and, and the Alliance's way forward has been to produce so much materials to help all of you all on right on the ground level. So Sarah, can you just come and let us know how best we can access the materials? The easiest way that you would be able to access the materials is to go to the Alliance website, which is alliancecpha.org. And on the menu point, you'll see on the right side, there is a menu point called COVID-19. If you click on that, you will see that at the very top, there is a link to the main technical note, then a link to all of the annexes, plus the associate resources, such as, for example, the webinar recordings, where you can get future webinars, a link to access the podcast series that's specific to COVID-19 and child protection. There is also an evidence synthesis series that you can access. Right now we have one on SGBV. We'll be loading another one on child labor fairly soon. You can also then continue down the page and look at by using the tags on the right side and search in that way or use a search function in general to get the specific resource that you're looking for. So you can do the drop down menu and look for the podcast, the webinar recordings, the evidence synthesis, or the resources or document itself, or you can just click directly on COVID-19 and see that page. Thank you very much. So I'm going to go to a question that I think is really important that I want each of our panelists members to answer. I want to know what has been your biggest learning in highlighting and driving forward these complexities of keeping children safe within these times? The main thing was uh, like uh, building on what communities have already. Um, depending on uh, uh, like child, uh, child uh, um, community-based child uh, structure, child protection structures is very, very, very important. Uh, for example, like um, I was like surprised and amazed with uh, um, how nurses in, in hospitals, for example, um, after like being trained on child protection, they, they could identify and refer the most vulnerable children, even like uh, um, related to COVID-19 or, or, or not COVID or other like uh, uh, risk factors. Uh, so this is something that we need to understand and learn. We don't have to do everything ourselves. Like we, knew, we need to depend on, on what we already have. Another thing is flexibility. Like now we've been uh, doing like 
very complicated work uh, from homes, like for the for the um, last three four months now. Um, and um, lastly, like the mainstreaming of child protection in other sectors as well. Like this is like really important. Child protection or protection in general should be always like central in humanitarian work. Hani did mention that uh, um, for for the uh, Ebola pandemic. Um, and I think now we, we can see it now more and more uh, um, under this. Um, uh, lastly, I think also depending on other expertise from other uh, countries, like um, this is something for the first time that like we all the world like have uh, um, uh, in common now, we all are stuck in the same place. So uh, we have access to lots of people who, who did uh, uh, this before. We don't need to, to recreate everything from the, uh, the scratches. So just like uh, depend on, on others uh, and their experiences. Okay, those are really big learnings from integrating and building on others' knowledge. Zanette, what would you say has been your biggest learning as you've worked in this area? This is really important uh, because um, actually I believe a paradigm shift is needed to deliver child protection. Uh, especially the importance of business continuity in humanitarian sector. Specifically, the child protection sector is needed. As Nirengi Association, we are we are uh, expressing and advocating this issue for a while before the COVID-19 because we are also DRR background. But the uh, disaster risk reduction or um, having an organizational disaster plan is different than having a business continuity plan. Especially in terms of the uh, business continuity in child protection sector, I believe each organization, also platforms, networks, uh, has to have one of the smart business plan. Just I would like to mention seven steps about this. For instance, identifying of key critical business function in child protection. This is one step. Other one, establishing of child protection objective of business continuity plan. And additionally, evaluating of the potential impact of disruption to children and workers, especially impact on the field workers to be protected. This is important issue. Distinct critical actions to protect children and staff, including volunteers. And fifth one, preparing a continuity plan for each critical service. And lastly, training of staff, including volunteers again, testing together, revising a, 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 together, and updating of business plan in child protection delivery. So this is my biggest, um, biggest learning in, well, the, in this context. That continuity is really critical. Audrey, what would you say is your biggest learning? It kind of goes back to what Riyadh was saying. I think for me, it has been the, the global aspect of the pandemic with so many countries being affected and, and how to adapt our response to answer the needs and support colleagues who are who are where facing for the first time emergencies in their country. And I remember discussion in chat box in previous webinars, but even here, like people, chart protection practitioners from country where they usually don't meet. They were starting, you know, interacting, exchanging about the situation that um, they were facing about child protection concerns. And, and it was Canada talking with Tunis and it was Italy exchanging with DRC. Like it was just incredible to see like everyone was just uh, concerned. And, and it has been a big learning because in somehow we needed to find a way to be able to support 
support everyone with, with the guidance uh, we were developing. And at the same time, and this is something we have been reflecting a lot uh, within the Alliance and our last annual meeting was on the humanitarian development nexus. And I think this pandemic has just pushed us to not take the time to reflect on that, but to actually work on the humanitarian development nexus. And I'm hoping we can as well in the future draw some lessons uh, from that perspective too. Thank you, Judith. Great, great. And Hani, your response to that question? Uh, what colleagues mentioned almost covers it. Uh, I'll try to mention a, a couple of other ones. Uh, one, one which, is, which is probably not just a lesson of this crisis, but many crises that I've worked with, worked in, is, is the idea of, uh, of humility and and the fact that the community that we work with, which is child protection workers that are dedicated, selfless individuals that work to protect children, and, and the amount that they know about how to do this and how to do this well. Um, so I personally constantly learn from, uh, from our colleagues in the field who are, who are doing this work um, kind of hands-on. Um, the other learning that kind of connects to some of the points that, that Audrey brought up is, uh, is the importance of context. And I think, again, it's, it's something that we always learn and talk and talk about. So it's not new, but I think because our audience just grew so much, as Audrey was mentioning, um, I think we, we kind of were faced with almost a new reality that we really have to think about how do we develop our, our technical material in a way that it applies that it can be applied all the way from Somalia um, to Italy to Canada, right? Uh, so that that kind of almost pushed us uh, outside of our comfort zone, which is the typical humanitarian um, context, which are still very diverse, but but at least there's some parameters that you can assume are are very similar. Um, and the last thing I would I would mention, which is one of the biggest learnings I think from from uh, what happened in the early stages of COVID-19 is, is that the evidence in our sector is so weak that we struggled to, even though we knew, for example, that from the Ebola crisis um, experience, we knew school closures and some of the other um, lockdown measures will negatively impact children. But we didn't have hard evidence for it. We didn't have evidence that we could put on the table and say, don't be so, so quick to put in certain uh, measures if, if, it, if it's not justified. I mean, many countries went under lockdown when, when they had one or two cases uh, and they closed the schools. And, and now we look back at it and we know that, it's, uh, that it probably wasn't justified all the harm that it brought um, to children, but we didn't have the evidence to, to prove this. And I think hopefully um, a lot of groups because of the global reach of the COVID-19 will work on on filling that gap, including ourselves at, within the lines. But I think not having evidence was, again, one, one big lesson for me. So big lessons. And just so you know, to re also reflect what Hani says about who the incredible participants are on this call and who are doing the work of the field. We have 42% of child protection coordinators on the call and 18% uh, child protection and social workers, and 16% child protection administrators. So over 76% of people on this call are people who are on the field doing the work. And so we have questions from the field that are really important. And here's one, how can we provide protection of street children? from COVID-19. During these COVID-19 days, uh, there was a platform in, in Turkey. We are also a member of this platform. Just uh, during the WhatsApp group uh, messages, uh, this point was raised. How can we deal with street children and how can we deal with the homeless people in the street? So uh, with the Nerengiz facilitation and the, with the contribution of the platforms, some NGOs, as I mentioned to you, 
they are uh, they are on the street they are working on the street but uh, we provided some protective uh, pro taken taken uh, taken care of the some protecting measures of them providing some protective materials and how can they communicate with these street children as protect is keeping them in the safe place and so on also we uh, we contact with the municipalities municipalities provided some safe spaces and um, according to uh, located according to covid-19 um, reality with getting expertise from the health experts and so on i mean again uh, a kind of self initiative uh, there were two main points protection of the field workers and protection of the street work uh, street children also homeless people so we experienced this type of intervention uh, during the covid-19 days i mean as a result you know the equipping of the field workers is really important we shouldn't forget them also coordination with stakeholders for mobilizing current resources for the sake of people in need okay thank you very much and this um honey yes go ahead i just wanted to add a, cu a couple of points um i think educational opportunities is is an important one for first two children because they're they often already are, are at a disadvantage in terms of uh, access to, to educational possibilities. Um, so making sure that, and, and of course, a lot of them don't have access to, to uh, equipment or uh, online uh, or Wi-Fi uh, to be able to, to benefit from online. So providing some, uh, some sort of educational support to, to them so that they're already been behind, don't fall even further behind. Pro provision of some of the, some of the most basic needs as, as Zainab earlier mentioned, uh, food, nu basically nutrition, sanitation, uh, even shelter. Um, and one that is, I think, very important and, and, and um, based on what we have talked about and, and a recent report that came out of, uh, out of UNICEF and ILO on child labor um, is protecting street children from uh, from going further into into worse forms of child labor, um, we we know that the likelihood of the informal sec sector, which is much more exploitative than the formal sector, uh, growing and absorbing more and more children is is very large in in the care and situation and going forward. So making sure that we we work with them to ensure that they don't go further into uh, into worse forms of, of child labor is, is extremely important. And another question that sort of tends to join with that one is around child-friendly spaces. Has anyone been able to operate a child-friendly space for children who have been displaced, for children on the street? And if so, how has that been done within COVID? Yeah, so maybe I can answer that as we Excellent. work with uh, displaced, uh, displaced children uh, in Syria. Um, so first of all, like try to follow um, the, uh, the health authorities uh, recommendations. Uh, so um, if you have a lockdown, don't have a child friendly space, you can do it online. Uh, we're like really happy to share what we have, uh, like the, uh, the uh, toolkit, uh, the activities, uh, we can share them with uh, any other colleagues who, who need them. Um, in case you're allowed to have children together, uh, you should have uh, protective factors in, uh, and uh, like equipment in, uh, in, in the facility. Um, so for us, we, have, we try to install uh, a uh, sanitation unit in uh, in each office that we have because like uh, when it comes to case management uh, we still have like to to accept some people entering the uh, the, the offices 
Um, another thing is try to be on a very good like referral pathway. So if you uh, like get in touch with a child who is who has the virus, you, you need to to act like very fast and refer them to uh, uh, to health or case management uh, uh, service. Um, also, you need also to, to be in touch with, with parents. You need uh, to uh, raise awareness about the pandemic. So, so the parents understand if the child like uh, shows like any symptoms, they should stay at home uh, until they are, they are better. In case you got a child, for example, uh, um, uh, in your office and you figured out later that uh, he or she has the virus, you need to get in contact with other like parents for other children and uh, uh, inform them about this. Um, so just like we need to, to think about all the possibilities and have some kind of uh, uh, scenario based like uh, a plan um, and then build our response uh, according to this, to this plan. But try to take it like from safer to the less safe uh, um, uh, activities. Okay, thank you very much, Riyad, for that. Really clear and really specific on some of the things we can do. There's a question here, and I think it might have been Hani who brought this up, who talked about children who've been neglected, and also that we are seeing increasing numbers of suicides. So the, the question is, how do we address these? Uh, neglect is unfortunately one of those um, child protection um, outcomes and, and risks that we, we often see as hidden. In a sense that a child that is, uh, that is neglected is less likely to pick up a phone uh, and call a hotline or be picked up by a neighbor who hears uh, a screaming child who is being beaten up, right? So neglect is, is, is almost a hidden crisis in, in a lot of uh, child protection work, work that we do. Um, and it's particularly important for younger children. Um, as, as we all know, younger children um, are at the stage, especially from zero to eight, um, or as early child, some of the early childhood development colleagues would define as from zero to five, um, are at a stage where, where contact and responsive um, and consistent care is extremely important for them. So if you are in a situation where a mother, a single mother who, who is an essential worker has to go to work, um, doesn't, doesn't have the, the normal social support that they have because of the restrictions of COVID-19, they can't put their children in school, the choices that they have is probably very limited to possibly locking their children up in, in, a, in a small apartment and going, going away. And if you're dealing with a two-year-old or a three-year-old, and if this is prolonged, you're potentially making a, a, a very significant damage to this child's brain development, which can hardly ever be, be reversed. I mean, it's, there are methods that can help, um, but it's very difficult to reverse some of these, these negative impacts that neglect can have prolonged neglect can have uh, for, for younger children. Now, the issue of, um, so now that all of that can also have effect throughout the rest of the, the child's life. Um, but talking about suicide, you often end up um, dealing with adolescents and, and, and youth in a lot of cases um, that feel that they don't have the contact that they need, they can't create the, the environment that is, that is conducive of their, their age or, or the, the activities that they would like to, to do in their age. Uh, they can't connect with their parents because the parents are probably also overwhelmed. Uh, and the tendencies for, um, for suicide uh, kind of rises and increases. I would, of course, love to hear Audrey's reflections on that as well. But I want to connect these two as well, that a family that is potentially in a, in a position to neglect their child at a younger age is also more more likely to have a child that has um, tendencies towards um, towards uh, suicide so these are not all, also they're not separate families in all likelihood these are families that have le less resources and are more stretched 
Okay, and Audrey, did you have a comment that you wanted to add to that? Yes, and I'm, I'm going to be quite quick on that. And um, yes, often is adolescents and youth that are um, fragile to, to suicide. And, and I mean, and this is something that has been quite hard with the COVID-19. It's all the lockdowns that we have talked about, but it is as well the uncertainty for the future at a time where they are actually building their identity more strongly as an adolescent than the youth. And they start thinking about their future. And I know that in many countries, for example, final exams have been canceled, university have stopped and, and all those type of things. So not only they have been cut from their social network, but there is as well a lot of questions about what's gonna come next, what they are going to do. Is it, you know, like we've been talking about um, economical burden and consequences of the COVID-19 and we know that, you know, unemployment is going to rise and all these type of things. And we are talking about a generation of children or the next generation. And it can be in addition to all the overwhelmed information that they are receiving on a daily basis. And I have to say that at one point, even myself, I stopped listening to the news during COVID-19 mm -hmm. and confinement because, you know, I, I was getting anxious. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can imagine as well for, for young people who, who are trying to figure out their future, how this has been, in, has come to impact uh, their yeah, their life and, and their thinking and and the isolation and and something that we haven't talked as well too much, but it as well all the all the other issues such as, you know, um, it's 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 a period of age where as well there are, you know, kind of exploring their sexuality. Um, they have as well their all those questions about their sexual identity, LGBTI children, for example, that are already in a normal situation going through a lot. We can as well refer to children victim of bullying at school. And then, you know, like they, they are home in probably a very tense environment. And, you know, they are carrying as well some weight. And I think we need us to, to keep that in mind in addition to the, uh, I would say, normal or basic psychosocial distress that everyone has been through uh, due to the, to the COVID-19. I think the other really important issue is that we should never be afraid to talk to kids about this. So if we feel a kid might be, might be thinking about harming themselves, we talk to them about that. We bring it into the open so they aren't bearing that by themselves. So I'm going to have two other questions for you and then we're going to have to say a big thank you to everybody. Uh, also because we know kids have been isolated by themselves, they've turned a lot to online. And we also know that a lot of predators have turned to online. So we have a question here. Is there guidance on online sexual abuse and exploitation? And how do we prevent that? Just I will address one resource. Uh, UNICEF okay. has already um, published really practical and useful uh, technical note. Uh, cyber uh, bullying and cyber abuse and protection from children about um, cyber abuse, uh, this type of um, technical note. We adopted these guidelines, so because of the time limitation, I am stopping here, but uh, we practiced and adopted these guidelines, very, very useful. So my last question, and this is to each of you, is that we started talking about the passion for child protection. But we also know that this is very difficult and this can be very emotional work. We're working with children. We know that children are being harmed. So my final question is, how do you keep going within this time of COVID-19? What do you use to take care of yourself? Like uh, all of us are um, overwhelmed now. Um, uh, I don't know, but like um, uh, for me, like what keeps me like going on is the vision. Uh, as I come from like a um, torn country now uh, with war, um, 
I, I, I really like um, have like lost hope in um, in grown ups. Like mm. I don't know if they can like ever like rebuild the country. And uh, children are like uh, resilient enough to take this task in the future, but at the same time they are vulnerable enough to to uh, to be hurt now. So, um, like for me, if I want like uh, to see my country again, like uh, to to be built again, I need to invest in children more, so they can take this task that we have uh, like um, failed to to take on ourselves at this moment. Yeah, I just touch um, Riyadh's um, response because Riyadh was or ha is so comfortable for talking about for others. But the question um, when raised to him, he is struggling with this because I am sure he hasn't any uh, I idea for taking care of himself, you know, mm -hmm. just thinking about because he is helper. So he should be strong. So sorry, Riyadh, just, um, you know, thank you for sharing your, um, your reflection. Actually, from, uh, from my part, <clears throat> I can say, um, as in the Rengi Association, we are dealing with MHPSS. So we are delivering the Helping the Helpers program in MHPSS. Therefore, I personally experienced the importance of self-care. Mm. You know, dealing with vicarious trauma, dealing with burnout, dealing with, with post-traumatic stress, and so on. So uh, prioritizing of self-care is one of our responsibility. So defining of our personal coping mechanism is really, really important. I may recommend to colleagues and to others, I mean, don't hesitate to prioritize yourself for using the oxygen mask in case of emergency, as we have been instructed at the airplanes, you know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> because we ultimately have to take care of ourselves because before uh, we can help others. A really good point. And Hani, what about for you? Thanks. Um, and I noticed, Dana, if you also did the same thing that that we are, you talked about how others should be taking care of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I will try to answer your question. I was actually tempted to go the route of Riyadh, but because of Zainab's, <laughs> I'm just going to say that my my main supporter in all of this is my small child, mm. who, uh, whenever I feel overwhelmed or um, or tired or feeling burnt from 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 the, the pressure, I just turn to him and he, he has become my counselor at, at three and a half year old. Um, but it's really, it, it just reminds me of, of something that I heard from a great mind uh, in early childhood development, of how this interaction with a child is a, is a ping pong match or a tennis match where mm. you, you serve and the other one responds. And, and this two directional relationship with, with a child in, in my case, gives me a lot of strength to be able to go forward. The gift of children. And Audrey? Thank you. So I'm going to half try to answer the question directly and half take another way, if you don't mind, Judy. Um, taking care of, of myself, I think, um, have been lucky under confinement to, to have my two cats who reminded me quite often um, that they need cuddles and, and food and all these type of things. So they, they as well kind of push me to, to slow down a little bit. Um, and then doing some soft activities like knitting, yoga uh, has been very helpful. I have to say um, that I've been, um, that I had great colleagues I could talk to. Um, with whom I could share some of my doubts, because let's face it, the this situation has been a, a roller coaster from an emotional perspective for everyone. And there were weeks I could move mountains, and there were weeks it was a little bit harder to get out of the bed. But just to be conscious of that and being able to talk with colleagues about that was super helpful. And the last point. Um, it's, it's you, it's the community of child protection practitioners that really help me to move forward on a daily basis because, you know, 
everyone has been in the same situation, facing personal challenges, facing professional challenges. And regardless, like everyone is working hard around the clock to, you know, not only support the Alliance in developing resources, but as well to really protect children. And, and Riyadh and Zeynep are, are good examples of that. And it has been for me a real inspiration, you know, to have the, the, the chance and the privilege to be part of that child protection community. So really big thank you to all of you because, you know, receiving an email from somewhere around the world and say, oh, we can pick up the translation here of the technical note, you know, don't worry about that, we take care of that. Or, you know, learning through Zena that, you know, uh, webinars were held in Turkish to, you know, extend the reach, just make what we are doing um, kind of meaningful and it helped us to just keep going. Yeah, well, I want to say a big thank you to everyone. I want to thank the people who participated and listened and sent in your comments and your questions. I want to thank the panel. You were wonderful bringing both your on the ground experience and your global experience. I want to thank the people who wrote the first technical note because they set sort of the standards and then the people all the people who contributed to the second technical note uh, i want to identify susanna davies who she did the first and helped with the second so she stayed with us through the whole time and for all the reviewers and for making this work possible because i think audrey has brought it together when she says it takes all of us working together to make this work and to do our best to keep kids safe in this world and in these unprecedented times. So thank you and have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening or night, wherever you are.